right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, how are you doing? Oh, look, come on, you got to give me better than that, you know. This way it sounds like you're half dead. It's been a long day, I get that, but you're not dead, come on. So how are you doing? All right, that's much better, that's much better. Look, um, it's a little risky this late in the day to start uh, by giving you a whole bunch of new stuff, right? I don't know how much bandwidth there is left in those brains of yours. What did Jean-Francois call it? Oh, come on, you remember. Sorry? Nice, ego depletion. Jean-Francois, somebody was listening. <laughs> okay, no, um, I kind of want to bring a lot of the themes that emerged over the course of the day, just touch upon them, and also take a step back and talk about what are we doing over here, right? What, what are we doing? I mean, I, I like to start with this question, you know, just what are we trying to accomplish? Uh, you know, I, I'll throw out a few hypotheses to f figure out what of these hypotheses might stick, but just generally have a conversation at the end that kind of brings us back home so that I can hand it over to um, uh, Hero and Ilian uh, and, you know, we can wrap the day up, right? This is what I want to do. So what I want to talk about is this notion of judgment. Not my judgment, your judgment. The judgment of all the leaders in the room. And why is that important? Where does that fit into the whole saga, uh, you know, everything that we've been talking about, and how does it matter in this whole context of, or, or conversation about globalization, Asian economies, and so on and so forth, right? So that's what I want to talk about. Right? <laughs> Feels a little bit like that, right, at the end of the day. Uh, you're kind of sitting there, no, you're doing fine. Oh, come on, that's great. Uh, you're, you're, you, you, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. <laughs> okay? Uh, can, you, can you tell me two things Komiyama-san said? What? <laughs> Who is Komiyama-san? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Look, it can get to be a little bit like this, right? By the end of the day, you know, lots of information, lots of data, good stuff. It, it absorbs a lot of energy. And, and at the end of the day, we're sitting like this saying, you know, wow, what, you know, freight train got hit me, right? Um, I just want to take a step back and say, look, a lot of the things we've been talking about today are not new. Are they? Right? When was the first sort of attempt at globalization? When did they happen? Come on, give me a break. When? East India Company, there, that's a shot. Even before that. You remember the eunuch Chinese admiral? What was his name? Cheng Ho, right? Uh, when was that? Around the same time the Vasco da Gama and people were moving around. This, this, this thing has been afoot for a long time, right? Where people said, let's go for resources, let's go for trade, let's do... Th it's been around for a long time. But somehow, today, you know, the issues seem to be as germane, as, uh, you know, grabbing us as they ever did, right? They seem to be very real to us. Similarly, this whole issue of diversity, we've known for a long time it's not about CSR, is it? Is it? What's it about? It's about innovation. What else is it about? Performance. What else? Sorry? Survival. Tell me more. What do you mean? It, you have to engage in diversity now it, in order to survive, right? Um, do, do you want to give me a little bit of perspective on that? Why do you say that? It's, it's all about life. And life without diversity. Nice. Nice. Right? So this is very well put, very well. This is, an e this is the fundamental evolutionary argument which you're making, right? Without diversity, we die, okay? Actually, from a decision sciences perspective, all of you are in Seattle alums. Every one of you has taken a, 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 a course in decision sciences. Tell me, from a decision sciences perspective, why is diversity important? Antoine, you know, right? Why? Because we need that. <laughs> because we need that, yes, that's no, good. No. Because, because we need that to feel at ease in, in the world we live in. So this is about feeling comfortable. If we don't know how to show up in the world we live in, if we're not comfortable seeing ourselves in that world, we feel we don't belong and we, 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 we're not productive. Okay, anything else? Decision science's perspective. Why is diversity, yes sir? <coughs> it gives you more options, right. Notion of the wisdom of the crowd. Anybody encounter that? What is the wisdom of the crowd? The idea of the wisdom of the crowd we've known for a long time is built on the following principle. Never hire the best expert you can find. Hire the cheapest one. 
Why? Because when you add one expert, any expert, to the option, to, 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 to the forecasts made by any one expert, the increase in accuracy is tremendous. Right? So it almost doesn't matter which that first expert is, because you're going to get that increase. And what we also know is when you put a crowd together, when you try and extract the wisdom of the crowd, and I'll come to this in slightly greater detail, if there is an acceptable level of diversity in that crowd, then all of a sudden you make better judgments, you make better decisions, right? So diversity we've known for a long time, and we've taught this at NCAD. Well, you guys seem to have forgotten. <laughs> come back, you know, we've got more courses. I mean, you don't have to come for an MBA, right? Um, so, so we've taught this for a long time. It's not about CSR, it's about good judgment. It's about better decision making. But at the same time, this whole issue of diversity seems to have gotten us. We're still struggling with this issue. Why? Well, I'm going to come to that in a bit, right? I'm going to give you a couple of hypotheses about what might be going on. I'm going to talk about a couple of gaps that exist between what we say and what we actually do, right? And why they come up over and over again. And so as the final panel, innovation or entrepreneurship, listen, we've been there, right? Uh, it's going on all the time. By the way, who invented the dual SIM card? Do you know? Who? Nigeria. Right? The Nigerians. They kind of you know, put things together and somehow made it work and, you know, until the rest of the world figured out, oh shoot, there's value here, right, and caught onto it. My point is, it's there, it's happening all the time, and yet, yet, when we come to forums like this, they exercise us, these issues, they grab us, and we still seem to be wrestling with them, right? And I want to talk about why that might be, right? So, uh, my objectives here are very simple, we've heard many messages over the course of the day, can we distill them into summary thoughts about what this means? Right? That's going to be my ambitious attempt, to kind of bring it all together into something that makes sense. Uh, and finally, can we remind ourselves of some practical ways forward? So I'm going to try really hard not to introduce new concepts, because um, it's 20 to 5. You're, you're not dealing with new concepts now. You know, you're done, right? So, so let's just reiterate some of the main messages. Let's just do that. Okay. So why do we do events like this? Anybody? Fun. They're fun. Okay, that's good. What else? Why do we do events like this? What, you think that was sarcastic? <laughs> Why do we do events like this? Look, one of the things we've been told is this. It's good to get together, particularly in a community that we feel comfortable, and talk a little bit about how we can prepare for the future, right? What's wrong with that? We're all in Seattle, so we have one particular view of what the future might look like. What else? You know anybody who knows what the future is going to look like? Yeah, that's my point, right? But it seems to be the same question. It, we're getting back to it. I'm getting back to it. I'm reiterating it exactly, exactly right, right? So to learn new skills, even that doesn't seem to sort of make sense. I mean, Jean-Francois taught us a couple of skills. Can you tell me two skills that Jean-Francois taught? What? I think I'm going to have to call you back again, Jean-François. Yeah? <laughs> but he did. He talked about some ba basic... Oh, you made notes. So give me... <laughs> Listen, the dean of INSEAD, he's made notes. What did he say? Mindfulness. Mindfulness. Practice. Practice. Very good. This is good enough. I just wanted to. <laughs> the dean was taking notes, Jean-François. This year, the, no, you're done. You're, you're done, you know. <laughs> so, so what I want to say is, look, you know, these glib sort of things that we talk about these events, they make sense when they land in some way in which they matter. Right? The conversations have to matter. They can't just be intellectual sorts of meanderings that we do. You know, all of us, we come to these events and some different things land on us. Right? But ultimately, they create value because they land on us. That's what we want. Right? That's, I mean, if they don't, if we're not engaged, this is what I said first thing in the morning, if we don't find ourselves engaged, it's a waste of our time. Right? So a little bit, this is the reason why we come here. The truth of the matter is, you've seen this before today, right? Right. It's much more common. So now, if we have to address real issues, this is what we have to talk about. Am I right? Vanessa? 
Yeah? This is the point. I mean, we can talk ourselves blue in the face, right? We can read the books, we can go to sessions, we can gain knowledge. The big issue is why is it that we're not able to do what it is that we know we should be doing? To me, that's an interesting question. And that's a question which exercises me a lot. And in a sense, that's the question that Jean-Francois was talking about as well. All those of us who work in the area, broadly speaking, broadly defined as leadership, it's much more an area that talks about behavior, right? Why do we behave in the ways in which we do? Uh, it, 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 it's important for leaders, but it's important for everybody else, right? We're really exercised with this gap, the knowing-doing gap, right? How much we know, how little we do, right? So in such an environment, what messages can we give you that can address the real issues that you're struggling with? This is the question that we're going to ask, okay? So, the problem with what we know, ladies and gentlemen, and those of you who've seen this before, you will know I talk about this a lot, is it looks like this. Right? Does anybody know what that means? What does it mean? Come on, you went to INSEAD. You did understanding decisions and judgments. You did statistical analysis. What is this saying? Beg pardon? We all, know something different about we all know different things, but it also says, listen, what you've heard over the course of the day, right, is two different forms of thoughts. One is evidence, the other is opinion. Both are important, right? We need opinions because people, we, in some cases we get opinions um, uh, where opinions, we don't have a lot of evidence, so opinions are important because they give us a way forward, they give us hypotheses that we can test. The second is evidence. Unfortunately, all the evidence in the social sciences looks like this. What that means is that the best explanatory power that we have for any outcome that we're interested in is very small. And you know, at one level, what can we do? That's what it is, right? This is the best we have. You know, if our explanatory power explains less than 10% of the variance, what can we do? That's what we have. However, statisticians will tell us the following thing. They'll tell us that with such small explanatory, by the way, this guy's also a colleague of ours. Uh, he's retired. Uh, he lives on a, a boat somewhere off Greece, which is, uh, I'm sure, a very pleasant place to be. Um, uh, but, but the point they make is the following. That's great if that's what we know, but it's useless from a predictive perspective. What does that mean? What that means is the following. Until today, I have not met a single senior leader who came to me and said, Narayan, thank you so much for your model. Now I know how to make a decision. <laughs> it's true, right? What they've said is, thank you for your model. I'm still going to use my judgment to make a decision, right? Think of the following thing, ladies and gentlemen. There are people from McKinsey in the room, BCG, Bain, etc., etc. Never mind, maybe there aren't, okay? Let's think. Imagine you're running a business and you get a beautiful, polished, color-coded set of PowerPoint slides that come with a strategic recommendation for what you should do in a market, right? You're so fresh you can smell the ink off the pages. Okay, they land on your desk. What do you discover at that point? Well, possibly one of the things you discover at that point is all of a sudden it's your call. This is what McKinsey says. Are you going to do exactly what they say? In which case, what's your value add? Right? If you're not going to do exactly what they say, then on what basis? Are you going to know more than the people you hired to actually find out everything that there was to know about their business? The answer is no. So on what basis are you going to make a separate sort of decision? But actually, the truth is, you get called to make this sort of judgment call all the time. That's your job, ladies and gentlemen. And I've got good news for you. It isn't going away anytime soon. Right? It isn't. Right? This is the value you bring to the table, the value of your judgment. Now, the moment you say you're going to exercise judgment, we've got a problem. Most of the evidence says your judgment is biased. That's the bad news. The good news is that it's systematically biased. Why is that good news? 
because you can correct for it. Exactly right. You can correct for it, right? So the question is, how can we work on, and the goal of leaders, at least, you know, so when you, when you exercise judgment, one of the things that we need to work on is whatever systematic bias there is in your judgment, we need to take that out of the system. So the story I'm telling is very, very simple. Events like this, occasions like this, any kind of learning, once you go past the need to get a degree because you need to learn everything that there is to be learned, once you get past that, you're interested in things that can help you do your jobs better Monday morning, correct? Now, in which case, anything that I tell you, you're going to look at through the filter of your judgment, right? And I'm telling you right now, and I think everybody who works at a business school will tell you, that judgment is more often than not incorrect. It's flawed. So what we need to do is to correct for the systematic errors that creep into that judgment. But it doesn't mean that you can avoid the responsibility of making that judgment call, right? It doesn't. And we know that people make judgment calls all the time. So in military contexts, in, in weather forecasting, this is a particularly interesting context, right? It's a neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, and, and what was discovered over there was, you know, nurses, nurses who work, right, not doctors, but nurses who work in neonatal intensive care units, they work on the basis of very little uh, data to make their judgment calls. So for example, uh, you know what a neonatal intensive care unit is? Right, these are prematurely born babies, right? And these are very fragile babies, right? So they're kept in very sterile environments because any disease could kill them and all the rest of that, right? The truth is, if you were to wait for any physically observable symptoms to show up in those babies, in many cases, it will be too late to start any programmed medications. So what they count on, what the doctors count on, is the ability of nurses to look at a plethora of factors without being able to identify any particular one and to arrive at the conclusion that we need to start medication. And nurses in neonatal intensive care units are actually given the right, very often, by doctors to say, if you say we need to start treating, we'll start treating. Judgment. Right? That's just one example. We know we exercise it all the time. So the fact that we see in technical domains like this is not surprising anymore. We know that judgment gets exercised, gets exercised well all the time. In social domains, it's a little more complicated. Huh? And um, uh, we know that when ju judgment gets exercised in, s in, in social domains, we can improve upon it. So let me talk a little bit about the wisdom of the crowd. Um, Six to eight experts, six to eight judges, form an optimal pool of people whose judgments, when put together, provide a more robust estimate of what might happen in the future than any individual, right? The question is, what characteristics must these judges have? And it turns out that we know a lot about that, right? Um, uh, it turns out that if you have judges who are mostly independent of one another, not correlated with one another, right? then it improves the quality of the judgment that you get. Herein lies the importance of diversity, right? And this diversity is not just gender diversity or ethnic diversity, it's all kinds of diversity. It's age diversity, it's the background you have, right? The first form of diversity that we had in organizations were people who came from different disciplines. You know, you had finance people, marketers, m manufacturing people. You put them together, you have diversity, right? So the wisdom of the crowds actually is one way to improve upon the judgment of one leader by putting together multiple people who can give you ro more robust estimates of what might happen in the future than any one person can. Um, I'm not going to go into this. This is a particularly uh, uh, technical uh, subject, but all I want to say with these sorts of things is that we know how to improve the quality of judgment, right? We know how to do this in social contexts. So in meeting the challenges of Asian business, which is what we've been talking about today, the first thing we need to understand is to get what we know right, and that's what the speakers were doing today. They were giving us a sense of what we knew, what we understood, their own experience, giving us their insights. Now we have to watch our reactions to what those speakers were saying, right? Uh, because often in those reactions lie a series of biases. And when we correct for that biases, what remains is our judgment. So ladies and gentlemen, the second point I want to make after having listened to everything that we've said is the goal of events like this for us personally. And I said this morning that what I'd like to see us do is somehow engage personally with what was happening here. The goal has to be, what is our judgment and what it is that we're hearing?
right? Because by making that judgment visible, we gain insights into the best support that we have in our own leadership. So what is this judgment? It's a whole bunch of other things. I mean, we ex exercise it all the time. Think of the issues that we were talking about this morning. I put these in as we, you know, a, a leader from headquarters goes to run a team in another country, and that team doesn't behave the way in which he or she wants. What do you do? You exercise judgment. You come in with your stories, but you know, by now, I don't think anybody goes into a different context in, in which you're not culturally sensitive. You read the books, you go to sensitivity training, and you need to understand at that point. Listen, are all Indonesians like this? I've been told, you know, that in terms of time, they kind of show up. Should I now crack the whip? I mean, after all, this is a Japanese com company. Should we have, you know, Japanese time? Should we have Indonesian time? Should we have, I don't know, Swiss time? Whatever. It's a judgment call, right? All sorts of judgment calls, which we make all the time. Right? This is part of your jobs. You do it all the time. So how do we develop this judgment? This is where Jean-Francois was talking about just four simple steps. I'm going to frame it in my own way. How do you develop any form of expertise, ladies and gentlemen? Any form of expertise. Sorry? There you go. Practice. What next? Very nice. What else? Practice, feedback, and this was Jean-Francois's third idea, reflection, right? Um, somebody once said, you never, you, nobody ever learns from experience alone. What do you learn from? From reflecting upon experience, right? And so this was the point. So what I'm saying is, the doing answer to developing judgment is actually very simple. It's like you develop any, form, any other form of expertise. And that's built on four legs, practice, feedback, reflection, and coaching, right? Um, I like this picture. Who mentioned Roger Federer? Somebody mentioned Roger Federer, right? Uh, uh, so obviously we think alike, right? This, uh, Roger Federer has had a coach all his life. Anybody know who that is? If you've been to the AMP, you know who that is. Who's that? Severin Luthi. Uh, who's Severin Luthi? <laughs> <laughs> It's five o'clock, you know, what do you want? <laughs> Severin Luthi cracked the top 100, you know, in the ATP professionals ranking once in his life. Right? What's he going to teach Roger Federer? Roger Federer has a forehand that has descended directly from the heavens. <laughs> right? No, he, I'm, I'm serious. Have you seen it? It's all perfection. And when it's on, forget about it. So what's Severin going to say? Roger, you need to shift your grip a little bit. Yeah, really? To Roger Federer? <laughs> what's he going to say? Read the interviews. You know what he says? Which two? Very nice. That's exactly what the conversations he described are. But they're fundamentally coaching conversations. What he says is this. So Roger, what was your goal in that set? What were you trying to accomplish? Right? Um, how was that working for you? You were trying to run up to the net a lot. Did you, did it work? No, you kind of bailed out early. Why? Did you get scared? What was going on? Those are the coaching conversations you have, right? He can't tell him. He can just hold that mirror up. That's exactly right. So in the development of any form of expertise, there's four legs. Practice, feedback, reflection, and coaching, ladies and gentlemen. And that's doing. That's what we do to develop expertise. Now, in your own lives, you're going to a new country. How do you develop, how do you practice and get feedback? What do you do? Well, one, you can come to INSEAD and we'll help you practice, right? Two. Two. Very nice, right? Some of the finest CEOs I've met and interviewed are the most curious people on the planet. Right? So I often go and interview CEOs right, to write a case or whatever it might be. Um, and they will speak to me. Why? Because I'm non-threatening. You know what? I don't even have a real job. You know? How can I be threatening? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, he has to say I have a real job. But you know and I know it's not a real job, right, what I do. <laughs> um, so, so, so I go and speak to these CEOs, and I'm asking them questions about their lives. And very often, 10 minutes into the conversation, I realize that they're asking me. You know, so why did you do this? Why did you go? And what do you think they're doing? I see. I actually see what's happening. They're actually 
reflecting, if I was in your shoes, how would I have made the decision you made? Why did you make it in the way? And that desire to understand is actually practice, right? It is practice. And so practice can happen anywhere. The important word is it has to be deliberate practice, right? You have to put yourself into a situation where you say, can I deliberately practice? Now, for most of us in our jobs, we just do them. We're not practicing. We're doing them for real, right? We have to find a way where we can step back from the hurly-burly and practice. Feedback is tougher. Feedback is tougher. And that's where, you know, the kind of bonds that you form at INSEAD come in that useful, right? Because it's very hard to get noiseless feedback in your companies, correct? The feedback that you get in your companies is very, very noisy. Uh, very often, the only feedback you're going to get is what? A justification for the bonus you're going to get that year, right? That's basically the feedback you're going to get. So it's hard, right? Reflection, huh? How many of you have this practice of starting with quiet time, 15 minutes every day in the morning or 15 minutes at night? Can I see a show of hands? A couple of people, a few people, yeah. It's just a tremendous tool, ladies and gentlemen. Just some quiet time where you're not filling it with doing something else. Just reflecting on what's going to happen on the day to come putting an end to the day that was, right? It can be the most powerful aid that you engage in, right? So reflection, where do you reflect on what is going on in your lives? To be honest, if you're anything like me, right? You get a gap in your day, you turn on the computer, you go to the internet, you will read the news, you read a long story, you do something, right? You listen to music, no? No, you, oh no, you never knew that. <laughs> yes, I know, but you see what I'm saying, right? You have to create places in your life for some degree of reflection. The final thing, coaching. You know, when I started out at NCAD, this was almost 15 years ago, and I tried to introduce coaching into our programs, there was a very senior German uh, uh, CEO who told me, Narayan, if I go back to my board and say that, you know, I'm going to start in coaching, uh, they're going to wonder if they chose the right person. But things have changed since then, right? Things have changed dramatically since then. It's a much more acceptable thing for people to do. Uh, just think of this. At the very least, you have very lonely jobs. Right? There are not that many people you can speak to. Right? Your positions, when you get to very senior levels, are very lonely. And sometimes a coach is someone who can just put things in perspective. Right? Just help you think through. And like I said, he's not going to improve your forehand. Right? He's not going to tell you how to change your grip. But he is going to give you the space a little bit to understand what it is that you're trying to do. So this is the doing answer to developing judgment. But you know, even, yes sir? I don't want to answer that because it can be very complimentary. I think it's part of being coached. Yes. In my first time in Japan, and I tell my normal students the same part, open up your hands and take it all in. Right. Use the mic. Sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm just trying to say to all the Japanese hosts, this is my first time in uh, Japan. And uh, I kind of tried to open up the antenna, take everything in, yeah. uh, wander around the subway, go into the shops with a big smile, ask for things in only English, yeah. <laughs> and people are fantastic. They open up and they come to you. And you take in so many good vibrations yeah. of what is around you. And I, for me, that's been a fantastic experience here for the last uh, two, three days. So I want to say thank you. But it's also part of my personal cultural adaptation right. somewhere I right. know nothing about. Right. So there's an element of practice, there's an element of, you know, trying to see what the environment does to you, getting feedback from the environment and so on, right? Exactly right. But I want to say that even when you're doing everything that you possibly can, sometimes the shit does hit the fan, right? And you find you're getting defensive and you find, uh, you know, you think you're consulting your teams, but you know what? Uh, there's pressure from headquarters, you need a decision, and so you're going through the motions, you're going through the motions, you've called the team meeting, you want everybody's opinion, but they know and you know that you've really made your mind up, right? Or you're advocating your views and you're really not encouraging anybody to test you or push you or so on, you know? And when people start asking you questions, um, you, you're really not signaling that you're open to these questions. You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Right? It happens. I mean, look, it happens to the best of us, with the best of intentions. Right? We attribute meaning to others. That guy wanted to shaft me. I know it. I saw it in his eyes. Right? And you have no evidence at all. Right? 
So when that happens, when negative emotions start creeping up over us, when they start taking us over, what can we possibly do? And I think the answer that we would like to suggest is just two things. One, start becoming aware, and two, start becoming mindful. You notice that these are not new messages, right? I'm just repeating messages which you've heard over the course of the day, just to say, so the logic that I'm get, dr dr trying to drive here is the following. Do not worry too much. Of course, you need to know what the evidence says, but do not worry too much about do you have all the answers in the world. Ultimately, you do exercise judgment, that's what you get paid for. Understand that that judgment is biased, but you can correct for it by understanding what the principal biases are. Eventually, you can improve the quality of that judgment. How? Through practice, feedback, reflection, and coaching. Even if you do that, there are going to be moments when shit happens. Right? And when that happens, what do you do? You focus on awareness, and you focus on being mindful. Now, Jean-Francois talked about mindfulness, and uh, you know, he mentioned things like this. Right? Thich Nhat Hanh's modern translation of Buddhist sutras, John Kabat-Zinn, mindfulness. Listen, if this works for you, that's great. But there are a lot of people for whom this is still too much California. <laughs> right? And if, if that doesn't work for you, here's a simple approach. Mindfulness can just be the opposite of mindlessness. Right? So think about this. Mindfulness is a flexible state of mind in which we're actively engaged in the present, noticing new things and sensitive to context. Can I just put this simply? You know when you get into a argument with your partner or your kid or somebody like that, and you know that they're going down a certain path, and you know where this is going to end up, try the following exercise. Just look for two things, two, that are different from the previous time you went down that path. Actively go out and look for those two things. That enhances mindfulness like you will not believe, right? If it's something where you're already certain it's a very different path, then look for six different things. But look for something different. And that creates a, a, a really a sense of context, nuance, etc., which is completely different, completely different from being mindless. Mindlessness is this. Right? We're just like automatons. We're caught in the grip of programming and logic that we don't even understand. It's somebody else's programming. It's our past. Right? That's come up and grabbed us by the short and curlies. So that's the story we've told, ladies and gentlemen. That's the story we've told over the course of the day. It's actually not a very complicated story. It's a, it's a story that's full of hope, actually. A and the hope comes from the fact that, look, there's a lot of knowledge out there, but ultimately the best source we have to rely upon is ourselves. Right? A and the way in which we get back in touch with ourselves is really not complex. It's just by opening ourselves up to what it is, how we're reacting, and being mindful of the context in which we're operating. So what does this all mean? Right, right? You know, I, <clears throat> I'm terrible on the roads. I, I don't know about you, but I end up uh, getting into arguments. I, I, I'm really not very pleasant on the roads. Um, and and uh, several years ago, my, my children were both younger, and they started giving me a hard time about it. My wife tried, but you know, she, just gets, she just tunes me out on the road. She just, you know, wh whatever. Mostly she drives, which is much better uh, for all of us and the sanity of the family. Um, but, but at some point I started wondering, you know, and people started giving me this, this bullshit about, you know, God, you know, principle of charity, you know. Imagine they're going to a hospital and that's why they cut you off. It doesn't work for me. I don't know if it works for you, but it doesn't work for me, right? Uh, I mean, come on, you know, I, I can see the guy, he's a moron, he's not going to any damn hospital, he cut me off, you know, what the hell? So I just used to get agitated. Then I started asking myself just this one question. This time that person cut me off, can I look at two things that are different? Just two things. It's amazing how that changes your mind. It's amazing how that changes your focus. Imagine you could do that in relationships. Imagine you could do that in difficult conversations at work. Imagine you could do that you know, in scripted environments. What's different? This is why this morning when we started out here, I asked you, I said, look, these are common topics that we're going to cover over the course of the day. Ask yourself, is there something new, something different 
about this time that you've heard those topics. That just changes altogether the nuance and the context with which you look at what is being presented to you. So ladies and gentlemen, what should we do? Um, Jan is here, so I'm going to finish what we do very quickly. <laughs> uh, you know, Jan is a nice guy. He's also the guy who controls the food and the drink, so um, it's important to keep him happy. I, I, I'm, not, I, I'm just going to mention a few myths that come up very often, right, in this whole business of learning and mindfulness and how our own learning, how our own habits kill mindfulness. Um, do you remember how a long time ago uh, we were taught that if we learn to do something over and over and over again, we just get the basics right and then we forget about the basics and then move on to the more complex stuff. It turns out that that might not have been the smartest thing to do. Right? It's quite interesting. But the moment we start getting into these habitual ways of behaving, we stop being mindful, don't we? Right? And somebody once said, actually it was Ellen Langer who once gave a great example. She said, you know, have you ever learned how when you get taught tennis, everybody tells you that for your forehand, your knuckle needs to be at a certain spot. And when you're hitting a backhand slice, you need to change your um, uh, grip over to a certain place. She said, then go and watch people who are playing the US Open. Not one of them has the same damn grip. What does that tell you? Obviously, there's something in yourself, the way you play, your size, your weight, etc., that tells you how you should play. But we get taught this. Maybe there's some value, whenever we encounter something new, to go back and say something like, who says that these are the basics? What is it that I don't accept? Thank you, got it. <laughs> right? Uh, second, have you seen Kevin Costner in this game, uh, in this movie, Love of the Game? No? Baseball movie? Yeah? What does he say in that where he just... He, he, clear the mechanism. Very nice. That's it, right? So he's going up the pitch, and, and here's the myth. You go, clear the mechanism, and, and his mind just shuts off all extraneous noise, and he focuses just on the batter out in front of him. And, 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 you know, it's totally silent, and he's winding himself up, and he's in the zone, and it's perfect Hollywood. <laughs> How often are you able to do this? Clear the mechanism. Wouldn't that be wonderful? What if you tried something else? What if you tried instead to pay attention to the mechanism? What if you actually tried to say, instead of trying to get rid of everything, just focus on a couple of things that were different? I keep coming back to this over and over again because there's huge value in this, right? Focus on two things or three things that are unique, that are separate, that are different. It turns out our memory of the circumstance gets better. It turns out our creativity gets better. It turns out our ability to perform in that environment also gets better, right? And the final thing, um, I don't know how many of you like rap. Do you like rap? Rap music? Oh, this young man does. <laughs> uh, they're not, not everybody in this room likes rap, am I right? Are there people in this room who don't like rap? It's okay, you're in a safe uh, environment. Okay, you could say yes, very good. There are a few people here. What if I told you you have to listen to two hours of rap and after that we'll go to a party? What would you do? Uh, how good is the party? That's a very good question, right? <laughs> and if it was a very good party, what would you do? Yeah, and you would sort of grit your way through it, wouldn't you? Yeah, and that's what we've been told. Grit your way through it. Now, again, we, you know, this is a very common experiment that's been run, and the experiment was the following. Let's send two groups of people to listen to rap, people who hate rap, right? One lot who have just been told they'll have a lovely party at the end, uh, you know, and all the rest of it, uh, and another lot who've been told your job is to find three things that you never expected to find in that music that you just heard. Guess who came away enjoying it more? It's not rocket science, ladies and gentlemen. Mindfulness, that's all it is. Right? It's just being mindful about what it is that we engage with. So I don't want to say much more um, other than to say our, our, our behaviors, our habits, our reactions today are a product of what has happened in the past. And if we're going to unlearn that, then we have to go back to the habits that we've created a long time before. And the way in which we do that is by becoming aware of them, by becoming mindful of them. So the story that I've told 
is really quite simple. Can we actually start paying attention to negative emotions? And when we find them, can we stay with them and not try and make it better? Um, there's a truth in this, which is pain can be tremendously transformative. Right? Pain can be tremendously transformative. So when we discover negative emotions, we sometimes try and polish them away, shove them under the carpet, do something with it. Instead, just stay with them. Let them, let them soak into us. Give us a sense of what it is that they're doing to us. When we do, can we inquire as to what new things we observe in the moment that are different from the past? What credible alternatives, hypotheses, could we have for what is going on? And can we carry these alternative hypotheses with us before judging? So the story we've told, and I'm going to finish a few minutes early, ladies and gentlemen, is actually quite simple. Right? There are lots of ideas. There's no shortage of ideas. And thank God for that, because if there weren't that many ideas, many of us would be out of jobs. Right? Uh, many of us depend on the consulting income from providing ideas. So um, it, where there are lots of ideas. You agree? Uh, I mean, there are never any incontrovertible truths. Those who trade will tell you. The moment everybody starts believing in the truth, what do you do? Sell. So, <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. All right. So the doing way of exercising judgment is straightforward. It requires practice, feedback, reflection, and coaching. However, doing is not always enough as our being encounters negative emotions and contexts. Therefore, dealing with these requires a mindful attention to the moment, the unique features of what is unfolding with us and around us. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a long day. I really didn't want to bring a whole bunch of new ideas, concepts, things like that to the table. I just wanted to say how much I appreciated being here with you today. Um, it's the first time I've attended one of these INSEAD forums and it makes me wonder why I haven't attended more of them uh, before. Uh, it was such an eye-opener to see uh, a rich community, uh, different perspectives from that community, different ideas. Uh, my own faculty colleagues, I learn every time I listen to them. Um, and mostly, actually, um, your good grace, your patience, your fellowship, uh, and your companionship over the course of the day. Uh, thank you very much. And it is my pleasure and privilege to hand back over to our Master of Ceremonies for the day, Jan. Thank you very much. Thank you.